Okay, welcome back everybody. We're continuing with uh, coding theory and this is uh, chapter 11. So uh, not too many slides here. I resisted the urge to add slide after slide after slide with all of the good ideas and thoughts that it provokes because uh, camming is the focus. Listening to the boss is the best way to proceed. And uh, Let's charge for it. Okay, so if we think about uh, encoding, he points out there's classically two sources of error. The source, meaning the data, how do we encode it so when it comes to the other side, we can unwrap it again, but there's also the channel that it travels on. And uh, uh, speculatively, uh, you could even say, well, what about that human encoding? Uh, but we'll, we'll keep that just a little bit to the side for right now. Okay, so how do we get the best source encoding? Well, back in the day, when they were starting from scratch and everything was variable length, it was just any number of bits. Well, Huffman is pretty powerful and good. And um, let's see if I can find it. Uh, I know I queued it up for you guys. Let me try to switch to this window. Uh, how many folks noticed what I wrote about David Huffman or the links I provided? Oh, come on. You guys need to read these questions. <laughs> I was just looking at them over break. Right. All right. So, uh, loading comments. Come on, you. Dr. Huffman came up with that encoding while he's a double E master's and PhD student. Um, something's goofy here. These questions are not just silly. At, at MIT, but then he went on to be a, a professor for many, many, many years and a contemporary of uh, Hamming, but he's up at UC Santa Cruz. He was also a Naval officer for two years. So, uh, um, you've all been warned, uh, you can do it too. And uh, you can make significant achievements, whether they're recognized academically or in the engineering field or conceptually just by your people or not. Uh, uh, there's a lot to be done. So I commend to you, and I'm sorry they're not coming up right now, but they should be the uh, comment questions they're having difficulty loading up. Oh, there they are right now. Okay, so you can look online for Huffman encoding and also David Huffman. Uh, indeed, uh, he's been, uh, I believe they've got a medal named after him. So the questions for this chapter are please uh, look at Huffman codes and just talk about one aspect of it. Similarly, I'd like everybody to pay attention to what the heck is a parity check? And we've already been talking about human and machine sources of error. Okay, so there are the thought provoking answers that you're expected to leave behind for your fellow classmates and for follow on students. Okay, so if we go to how do we get the best encoding, and at least for variable length, starting from scratch. Often was pretty darn good back in the day and it's still fundamental today. Uh, uh, well, boy, that looks hard. What's he really saying, all those inequalities? He's all he's saying is, well, if you've been sensible about it, if you've got a bunch of messages, one through N, bunch of terms, one through N, say uh, menu, noon, meal, cheeseburger. And some people will debate whether cheese and burger are two different words, but we'll, we'll leave that one alone for right now. Just as if you've got a, a message set of four, some of those words will be more frequent than others. 
And if you've been sensible about it, then the more efficient codes, the shorter codes, will go to the more frequent words. Oh, that's all this is saying. And he's saying, if you can pick an example like that, go through it, just try. Well, if, if, uh, if I'm gonna re represent all of my articles, A, N, and the, with the longest possible codes, then flip out that encoding and see if your message doesn't get longer. Yes, it will. Okay, so uh, let's keep going. So he says, well, if you want to, if you have a message set, a set of terms, and you have corresponding probabilities, they might be guesstimates of how frequently is a term used and how infrequently. Uh, I'll give you an example. 10 numeric digits. Are they used more frequently or less frequently than 26 letters in the alphabet? For a given message. Sorry, John, not hearing you. Oh, I, I didn't say anything. I was just reading the. Oh, okay. Sorry, thought you were. So uh, it sort of depends on the data. What if we go, oh, well, 26 letters isn't enough. I want 52 letters because I want uppercase, lowercase. Then for certain classes of message that are, well, the alphabet, you could easily find a probability list of the letters in the alphabet, which are used more frequently than others. It will depend, but you could find that. Might depend on language, might depend on vocabulary. But if you're sending a numeric message, you want the numbers to be really efficient. Oh, so there's the example of if you have a set of terms, for example, 10 base 10 digits and 52 letters, you could sort them by probability. You could also be very naive about it Oh, I'm going to put the numbers first and the lowercase letters second because I use those a lot more and the uppercase letters last because they're less frequent. And I'll keep it all alphabetically and numerically ordered because I don't care about other things. I want it to be easy to look up and debug. Is that a pretty efficient encoding for 62 different characters? Not bad. So he says, okay. Create the best encoding for the probabilities. We just created the probabilities for a 52 character set. Boom. Now, how do you get there from here? Well, this is the algorithm. And here's the picture of it. If we say, this is our most probable message, we'll give that a zero. If this is our next most probable message, we'll give that a one zero and so on and so forth. So this is actually Huffman's classic example where the probability is 0 0.4, 0 0.2, 2, 0 0.1, 0 0.1. Oh, that adds up to one. So that means we have a five symbol vocabulary. No other symbols are allowed. Therefore, those probabilities must be one. Those are nice round numbers. Oh, okay. Here is the algorithm for creating the codes, Huffman codes, that best represent that. Are there multiple Huffman codes that could be used for these flag symbols? Sure. I mean, talks about those. And you can look in the course notes or in his other book and find lots of examples on how to march through this. That was the frontier for a lot of activity back in uh, Hamming's day. But uh, so what? Well, it gives us the most optimal, most efficient codes. But do we always want optimal? Well, hmm. what is optimal? If optimal is shortest, then those probabilities will give us the shortest overall vocabulary in use for messages that match the probability distribution function that we chose. So maybe that's not the one we want. 
maybe we want a different efficiency of decoding. Like, for example, if you, let's pick a message that you might want to have very high probability on. SOS. Is that a good candidate for a high probability message? Oh, okay. So given any possible vocabulary of those 26 lowercase letters, 26 uppercase letters, and 10 numbers, well, capital S, capital O, capital S means hold everything, send help. So which symbol out of the entire alphabet would you put first and which symbol would you put second? Oh, oh by the way, you're in the water right now waiting for that drone to send a message back to the uh, ship you just fell off of. But that's, that comes later. For now, I guess, which letters do you think are most important? S and O. Boom. S because it's used twice. O because it's next. And, of course, it's on all capitals, right? If you wanted lowercase two, okay, well, we could put them right after as the next three. Oh, so now there's a, there's an explanation of an example of what's efficiency? Average code line, it absolutely depends on the eye of the beholder. If I want immediate action, if somebody says SOS, okay, that goes right to the front of the line. Okay, and it doesn't have to be an alphanumeric message. You could use symbols or, well, here are my top 20 words. I care about no other words. I have a 20 symbol code. Oh, huh. okay. So he says, you can still use this algorithm and get there, pick one optimum and then uh, tune it. Okay, why else did they like Huffman? Well, because, oh, if we can rank that algorithm there, we can, uh, we can write a little program that does that. And so all we would have to do is let it know what we want. So we'll write a program to do it. What would the input to this program be? By the way, John just solved the same problem that this program would be faced with. I want to have good Huffman encodings for my symbols. So what were the inputs we used there? Well, the S and the O, is that, I guess, is that okay. what you're... Yes, yes. We picked the terms of greatest interest, meaning highest probability of being optimum. So, uh, and then we had to know how many letters we were choosing from, and then we had to know, uh, maybe that's it. Well, if we could figure it out, just talking here and not even quite familiar going into it of, well, we got a vocabulary, let's pick the ones we care about most, put them at the front. And we now know the orderings. If we were going to do S and O in an arbitrary uh, scheme, let's, let's go one more step. What would the code for S be? It'd be on that top branch. Be zero. What would the code for O be? One zero. What would the code for little s be? One one zero. What would the code for little o be? One 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 zero. Oh, oh, this is the algorithm. This is what it is. Do and could we keep going down this line for another 62, 10 plus 26 plus 26 decision trees? Yes. Will the probabilities match? No. Will they be ordered according to our priority? I want SOS up front. Yes. Oh, so that's very mechanical. And suddenly we have an optimum, we have a code, we can write a program, boom. 
and it's going to be pretty compressed. I'll give you guys one other example. Uh, I haven't been able to look this one up yet, but I know of another Huffman encoding that was very interesting um, on a submarine. It was actually a shaft turn marker for counting the sh how, where was the rotation of the shaft. And it was kind of like a, a QR code almost wrapped around the shaft. It had, I think, three stripes, maybe four stripes of black and white markers. And the way they did that code was as you went from one number, say, uh, uh, zero to northeast, and then the next one would be northeast to east, and then east to southeast. If we did eight markers about what are the eight orientations, they positioned the code so that only one bit would change at a time, so that it was very, very trivially easy for a machine to read that thing spinning and always go tick, 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 and I know what the orientation is. There was no digital logic whatsoever. It was just tipping right over. Okay, so you can apply these codes in very unusual situations. If you think of such a situation, or if you know of such an unusual situation, oh, that's a really good one to put on the uh, course notes. Question? I'll have that written up at some point. Hopefully I can track her down again. All right, channel encoding. If we were just working a moment ago on how do I digitize the data, then what about the channel? Well, he goes through the map, that's okay. The key thing here is the, the what's the nature of it? It's different. Well, a parity check is very simple. You add up the numbers and they're either even or odd. Would you agree that if we add up any sum of binary digits, they're either even or odd? Does anybody want to challenge that one? Oh man, I'm gonna I'm gonna have to get a coffee company sponsor for this course. I think. I don't know. <laughs> okay, everybody, pick a number. Seven. Ready? Go. No, uh, zero or one. Pick a number, zero or one. Zero. One. Zero. One. One. Zero. Okay. Anybody else? One. Zero. Okay. I think I counted five ones in there. That sound about right out of nine people. Uh, is that even or odd? Is five odd. even or odd? Odd. Okay. So if we have an even parity bit, then we add one to that, and now that's zero. Okay. So if our parity check bit is even, and if you get out of all those bits, which was 10 total, if they add up to a six, which is even, then it was good. If it added up to five, then that means you failed parity check and there was an error in there somewhere. Oh, oh, it's just keeping count. Is the light on or off? On or off? On or off? If somebody tells you the light's on, but it's real dark in here, you know, well, something's not right. My parity check doesn't match. And, and you don't much care about how many thousands of times that light might have been turned on or off. You just go, uh, uh, my indicator in memory of what the status is doesn't match the actual status. Something's wrong. Okay. So if you're, if you're doing parity check on a light switch, you might want to make that parity check independent of your counter. And then you always have a second opinion on whether the counter is correct. So what Tammy's saying here is, well, you can do a lot of those ones and zeros in a row, and it's still going to be either even or odd. If we're even parity check, then whatever we add makes it even, and vice versa. But you always have a 50-50 chance with a single bit parity that, oh, that must be a good number. But if it's a wrong number, half the time I'll be able to detect it. 
okay? If the parity of our result was odd, we'd go, uh, either somebody miscounted or more likely we had a channel error. There was noise that flipped a bit. Oh, but wait a minute, we might flip more than one bit. Longer the message before you throw in that parity check, the harder it is. What's the simplest parity check? Well, if I'm sending you a one bit message, a single bit message, here's a quiz question. First, I send you a single bit message of zero. What is your even parity check result? What is your parity bit gonna say? Rephrase that. What number do you add to zero to get to an even number? You only zero. get two choices. You can either give me a one or a zero. What number do you add to a zero to get to an even number? Zero. Zero. Okay. So our first message is zero. Our parity bit is zero. Zero, zero is the bit pattern that goes across. Okay. Now I'm going to send you another single bit message. This time, stand by, I'm gonna send you a one. As the parity expert, you're gonna add a bit to that that adds up to even parity. What bit do you add to a one to get to even parity? Tag another one on there. A one? Boom. Okay, so we send that. And no others, okay? So perhaps the simplest parity check is for a single bit, we duplicate it. Could it still be wrong? Let's say I send you a one one and a lightning bolt comes out of the sky, knocks it dead and you receive a zero zero. What do you think? You don't see the error. Didn't see an error. I think it said a zero. Are you 100% sure it was a zero? No, but don't we then take into like the probability that more than one bit changes? Bingo. You say, oh, I could have had a two bit error, but I could not have had a one bit error because my parity check tells me that if it was one bit, I'd get a mismatch parity check. Okay, so this is what he's talking about here. Uh, what do you do if you get an error? Well, you could send it again. How do you know if you get an error? Well, if my parity check doesn't match, something wasn't right. Hey, send me another copy of the message. And you could just keep sending till you get it. And probably say, okay, I finally got a good message but that good message is only for two-bit error. It, it, you're confident that you didn't have a single-bit error, or you might have had a two-bit error. Okay, so, so it's a sliding scale here of confidence in your message receipt, how good it is. Very interesting. So how many, how much redundancy do we need? How much do we want? Oh, there's echoes here. Redundancy of earlier chapter, Hanning said, uh, well, the, which way was it? The, uh, the written word has about 40% redundancy and the spoken word has about 60% redundancy for people to people communications. And that's why written dialogue never sounds quite right. If you read the written dialogue out loud, it doesn't sound quite right. Oh, okay, but that's just on average. Oh, oh, oh. So, the answer is, it depends. What are we protecting against? How much error? What do we do about it? Well, we know we can encode anything. Can we encode it more to detect an error? Parity bit tells us a lot. Rarely in the books on parity is Hamming goes, oh yeah, about those people again. They kind of, they can make parity errors too, but not really the same. It's not a one and zero or does it add up? But transposition is a very 
common error. Did anybody have trouble dialing into the room today? Were you typing in the password? How about, okay, usually it's good. And if we get a single link, well, it's easy. We just click here. But if if you're clicking and typing in and, uh, oh, for me, I got to put in my participant ID. and There's a lot of handshaking there, a lot of ways for a human to screw it up. That's all human, Hamming is saying here. If a common human error is transposing digits, and your mileage may vary, but there, there are actual syndromes. Some people are more prone than others. Will your parity checker catch that? Probably not. No. Would. Have you seen a parity check on that? Who knows what a date time group is? Who can tell us what a date time group is? No, somebody who wears a uniform for their day job, Marty. What's a date time group? Day, month, year. More detail, please. Uh, so like military one. date time group on a military message. Uh, usually it's two digit day and then three letter month and then four digit uh, year, depending on the type of message, but. That's one kind, but usually not on a, on a, uh, say a fleet it's message. Usually, it's usually two, di sorry, Tobias, go ahead. Keep going, I'm uh, talking all the time. It's usually a uh, two digit day, and then uh, the time group with the uh, um, code, uh, code, so A or B or zero time, and then three letters of month, and then two letters of the year. Okay, how about a uh, time zone? Anybody know what Zulu time is? Okay, so if I say 01, 02, 20, Zulu, what have I told you so far? Told us 20 hundred Zulu time, which is some defined offset from where you're currently at in the world. Actually, uh, that'll be after the Zulu time will be after the Z. Zero one is month. Zero one month. Zero yeah. two is day. Two zero is year. If you have a two digit year, Zulu date time, the number. There are variations on this, but there's often in important messages, there's an extra digit at the end. What's that digit called? Zulu time is the Quenish mean time. And I thought the digit at the end is the checksum. Bingo, check some. Who was that speaking? Uh, Sinker, what? sorry. Sinker, thank you, Sinker. Yep, check some. Check some means it all adds up. A check sum is an alternate form of parity. If you add up all the digits and they equal six, then your check sum would be six, saying add up all my other digits, it should be six. And that is your parity check on everything else. Oh. Interesting. If your parity check value is 10, well, that relates to how much, how many errors can you detect? And so sure enough, Hamming goes right into all of these different things. What's the, what are the formulas and how can you do it? And uh, uh, don't take my word for it, go study, listen, and oh, we can get there from here. And whether we know what the most efficient is, we can make it decipherable. Here's a really decipherable one, ISBN. Did you guys read this one? Anybody like this, like, like I did? What did he say about ISBN? It's in the chapter, it's really easy. Okay, tell me what's missing from the following ISBN here. I'm reading, reading in this book. ISBN 0 13 139 172 4. Check them. Yes, but in an interesting way. And Check the other one. 
Okay. This one also da ends in dash four. Different ISBN number. Have you ever seen an ISBN number with a, minus, a dash X at the end of it? Only on made up pictures, not on a real book. Well, Hamming describes it in the chapter. So read that paragraph again, all of you. Uh, he says, oh, that's the, the reason you don't see that is because they just leave it off, except for every one in 11 books where you will find it. And that's the check sum that says, oh, these numbers don't quite add up, but the X indicates that. So there is a checksum in an ISBN that we use all the time and people don't notice it because it's just a DX at the end. Really interesting case. So we find different codes all over the place. And they're just less obvious now because we've sort of gotten used to it. And it's part of the framework, okay? Now to figure it all out, you gotta know your noise in the channel. You gotta know your bits and your encoding scheme, decoding scheme. And I would add the human factor too. If you're telling people messages, a short vocabulary, but two terms are easily confusable, maybe those are the wrong two terms to use. Okay. And if you think of uh, who knows what the phonetic alphabet is, who can tell us that one? Just a, uh uh, using replacing the letters with a word that's easily recognizable yeah. over the radio usually. So yeah, how would you exactly alphabet. right? Give everybody a question, please, John. Uh, how would you say "hamming" in the phonetic alphabet? Hotel Alpha, um, Mike, Mike, India, November Golf. Okay. Everybody just heard him spell the word "hamming." Hotel Alpha, Mike, Mike, etc. Oh, okay. That's an encoding. And just as John said, they chose, of all the words they could have chose, chosen for the alphabet, they chose 26 phonetic words that are distinct enough that even in a high channel garble, you go, oh, he said Mike. They won't say, did he say M or did he say N? M, N, say again. Oh, I still don't get M, N. Uh, uh, there's an encoding. Interesting, interesting. So you find them everywhere and the creativity, like he says here is learn the principles, then solve your problem. Oh, okay, given that we can do a code for almost everything, figure out what problem you're solving and then apply the code. Okay. So in your future career, when you get to the, well, we kind of know what we want to say, but we don't know how to say that. That's the problem talking to you and saying, you want to encode that. Think about your message terms. Okay, now he really gives a great vignette about this a couple of times in the next lecture. Um, do good stuff by being ready, but you don't have to sit on that. Rest on your laurels for the rest of your career. But it's better to be prepared. Okay, any parting shots on this chapter, please? Uh, 